Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Your Mark on the World show. I'm your host, Devin Thorpe, and we're producing this episode for Forbes, where I'm a contributor covering social entrepreneurship and impact investing. Today's guest is Jules Kortenhorst, who is the CEO of Rocky Mountain Institute and the Carbon War Room. Jules, welcome to the show. Thank you, Devin. Delighted to be here. Well, we're thrilled to have you. The first thing we need to cover is the mission of the Rocky Mountain Institute, which is where you have been working for some time now. Give us a little bit of the, the history of Rocky Mountain Institute and its purpose and mission. Rocky Mountain Institute was created 32 years ago by Amory Lovins, who is uh, still our chief scientist and uh, in many ways the inspiration for, for all of us here at the Institute. When he started the Institute, he identified a significant opportunity to transition the global economy to a more sustainable place, to, to a world of um, verdance and abundance for all. And that has been our, our focus and our mission for 32 years. Over the last couple of years, we've increasingly focused our attention on the energy transformation, the need to um, create an energy system that is clean, um, that is secure, and that enables prosperity for everyone around the world. And in that mission, uh, we found the Carbon War Room right on our side, which is why we have connected. So tell us about the the merger, the combination between Rocky, Mounts, Rocky Mountain Institute and the Carbon War Room. And the Carbon War Room was created uh, a little bit more recently, five years ago, by Sir Richard Branson, with a very similar mission as the RMI mission. Uh, they are also focused on transitioning our economy to a low-carbon economy through market-based mechanisms, business-led, driven by the economy. And we noticed that the two organizations have a wonderfully overlapping view of the world, uh, but are also very complementary. Complementary in the way we look at the world, the audiences we address, and the way in which we try to uh, create change. Um, so it made actually a lot of sense to put the two organizations together to enhance our collaboration in this space and have more impact. One of the things that I identify as being unique about your combined approach is you mentioned it. it. It's the abundance mentality and so many people associate an abundance mentality with uh, almost an exploitive use of natural resources. Can you explain how you reconcile that abundance mentality with a, a sustainable mentality? There are really two answers to that question, Devin. I would say on the one hand that we have to put ourselves in the shoes of those three billion people um, in other parts of the world that do not yet have a refrigerator or a television or a scooter, let alone uh, an automobile. And to look at the challenge of sustainability from the perspective of scarcity therefore would pose a massive challenge in terms of figuring out um, how do you combine the prosperity of those people with sustainability. So that's this the part of the focus of abundance. But the second part um, is that indeed a lot of the thinking of RMI, but I think increasingly also of businesses is that if we deploy innovation new technologies, new business models in an effective manner, then we are better able to, um, to provide for people in a way that is not exploitive of Mother Earth, that, that is actually combining sustainability with, um, with providing, with abundance, with, with an economic model that works for everyone. And I think that's critical. Amory has, has rather famously talked for years about how this uh, shift to a low-carbon economy uh, can happen, will happen, should happen. 
it seems to me that we are at a unique point in time, an inflection point where in fact what has been happening in, uh, in relatively small amounts it is suddenly gaining momentum and perhaps even influencing the price of fossil fuels. Uh, what's your take about where we are in this conversion to a low carbon economy? So we indeed feel the same way that the energy revolution is, is in fact accelerating and that we may well be at critical tipping points in a number of the key technologies. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, solar energy was a dream that RMI has been talking about for, for over 30 years. Uh, a dream that was technically feasible but that was still commercially prohibitively expensive until recently. In the last five years we have seen such a massive reduction in cost of solar that it is now within reach for much of the world and over the next five years for really most of the world. It has become or is rapidly becoming I should say the most cost effective way to generate electricity. Similarly the electric vehicle. In fact a uh, hundred years the first automobiles were, were electrically powered but the internal combustion for many years was the more cost effective way to move ourselves around. Now it seems that the electric vehicle is rapidly taking over. And we're not just talking about that beautiful Tesla, which is indeed a great car, but still a little bit above my budget. But we're also talking about the new Bolt that GM announced just this year and other forms of, of electric uh, transportation. And combine that with the smart autonomous vehicles that Google is working on, and you can suddenly imagine a world in which we share transportation where electric cars can find their own way to charging stations and where we will no longer be dependent on fossil fuels for transportation. So we think that some of these critical technologies are just about to become really viable. And then they also mutually reinforce each other because the electric vehicle is also the battery in which we can store the electricity that is abundant during the daily hours that the sun shines but may not be there as much uh, at other moments of the day. So the integration of these technologies coming together with energy efficiency, the LED lamps here around me, uh, all of that is, is rapidly accelerating and I think that the fossil fuel industry is starting to realize that this transition may well be happening faster than they ever thought. So they are seeing that demand is flatlining or even declining. In the United States, demand for electricity over the last five years has been flat even since the economy is starting to grow again. It's a good indication that energy efficiency is starting to work. Um, and the recent enormous drop in oil undoubtedly has something to do with the new discoveries here in the United States, shale oil, shale gas. But it also has something to do with the fact that cars are becoming so much more efficient. So some of what is happening is that fossil fuel companies are starting to realize that their business models may not be forever there. Yeah, it, it is interesting too. One of the interesting dynamics that I'm seeing is uh, the rapid development of the sharing economy. Uh, you, you alluded to that in fact. Uh, a few months ago uh, I sold my car. I, my, my wife and I don't own a car anymore. But uh, we live on a, a rail line, a commuter rail line. We, uh, there is a, a rent by the hour car share car parked in front of the place where we live. Uh, and of course Lyft and Uber are available anytime. And, and we have found it to be painless to go without owning a car. And I think that may be entering in as well as you suggested. What, what data are you looking at in, in, with respect to the sharing economy? Is that an influencer yet? Um, it is certainly starting to be an influencer, uh, maybe even more so in Europe than in the United States. Um, analysis by the New Climate Economy, a study that came out last year, illustrates very clearly that if we design our urban areas more compactly and more efficiently, 
and create effective uh, public transport infrastructures. And I'm from Europe, and I see the difference living here in Boulder, in, in, the, in the Colorado area, uh, how different it is. Uh, more compact urban areas, public transportation, and then combine that indeed with the sharing economy of uh, Uber or rideshare or uh, zip cars, which make for a completely different set of options. In fact, I look at my children who um, are on the East Coast, and they don't have the need for a car. They're happy to use those other forms of mobility. And I think the next generation is picking up on that idea very quickly. Yes. Uh, well, this is all just uh, exciting stuff for anyone who is interested in that sort of prosperous future that includes a, a really truly sustainable approach to to living and so it, it is fun to see it begin to really develop and take hold. I think it's exciting but we also have to recognize that where there will be tremendous opportunities in the marketplace where we have indeed great chances to create a better life there's also going to be some losers in that transition. Creative destruction, as Schumpeter, always brings with it winners and losers. And so part of what we are also engaged with in RMI is to help the organizations, the companies that have so far been engaged in the old energy economy make the transition to the new energy economy. And you've heard of the examples, companies like NRG, um, Nextera, that are leading the way in, in, in that transition. But just last week, even Shell and BP acknowledged that they have to start dealing with the reality that um, they can probably not sell and allow to be burned all the fossil fuel reserves that they have on their balance sheet and that they have to at least start thinking about that. So we have to recognize that there will be winners and losers and that we have to accommodate the transition and work with the people who may have to go from the old to the new energy economy. Clearly, you're thinking about an interesting question I've been thinking about, been meaning to ask you, and, and that is that utilities, public utilities that are uh, electric utilities, have by and large huge investments in uh, coal-fired power plants. Uh, a lot of those plants are very old, but they are, uh, for, for many, they're perceived to be the cheapest way to produce power. You mentioned that solar is now arguably or apparently or soon will be uh, cheaper than continuing to operate a coal-fired power plant, not just as compared to building a new one. How do we allow for a public utility with regulated profits to uh, get the capital and uh, deal with the accounting issues and the apparent losses of writing off a plant uh, and spooling up more solar? That is a very good question and um, it's actually a question that we are right in the middle um, of in, in working with the Public Service Commission of New York, helping them in, in designing the business models and the regulatory frameworks of the utility of the future. And we expect that if New York is able to crack that very difficult nut, that the models and the solutions that come out of that will also be implemented in many other states. It's a very difficult question because you're absolutely right to refer to the centralized power generation where there will be some write-offs. Uh, some of which is forced by the regulations uh, that are putting uh, a, a price in some way on the externality of CO2 emissions and, and air pollution, uh, the, the, the regulations known as 111D that the Obama administration and the EPA have proposed. Um, but even if that wasn't the case, winds in the Midwest and in Texas on shore is now clearly when, it is, when the wind is blowing, it is clearly the most cost-effective source of electricity. So what we're seeing is that once the capital has been deployed for renewable energy sources such as solar and wind, at the margin, they become the low-cost producer of electricity 
taking away demand from centralized power generation, coal plants, gas plants, or nuclear plants. And making that transition is not easy. In fact, many European countries are well ahead of us on this. Germany, Spain, Portugal, Denmark, all have much higher penetration of renewables in the order of magnitude of 20, 30, 40 percent, and are already struggling with this exact question. Um, so we will need to define those new business models, create the regulatory frameworks. It will involve some write-offs, and it certainly will involve some very difficult adjustments for some of the publicly owned but also the investor-owned utilities. So yes, there will be there will be some some fallout, um, and it will be interesting to see which are the companies that are able are best able to make that transition effectively and to learn the lessons quickly to adjust their organization and be ready for the new world. Yeah, it <clears throat> it is exciting to think about. Really interesting. Uh, Jules, before you go, I know we're, we're over time. If you have just five more minutes, I want to ask you three quick questions uh, just to get into your psyche. But Jules, the first is, clearly you're a talented man. You could be doing anything. Why do, why do this? Why do you care? That's a simple question, uh, Devin. I have four children. I feel very strongly that we have an incredible responsibility to pass this world on to them as the same safe and, and receptive place that we've been able to grow up in. And um, as many have said, this is the moral imperative of our generation. Uh, it is also a fascinating challenge as we've been discussing. It's intellectually challenging. Um, I happen to have worked in the energy space before. I bring some relevant skills. Uh, so it is very exciting to be working on these subjects, but it is also a moral imperative. Yeah. There are times for all of us that life gets challenging, hard, and difficult, and most people, most of us look to role models for inspiration when we're down. Who do you look to as a role model? There are many people in this space that have been um, engaged, have been working on this with, with passion, uh, and have set the tone. Our founding fathers, uh, both uh, Sir Richard and, and Amory, are tremendous sources of inspiration. Um, but if I think of very personal inspiration, I often think back to my father, who um, in a different field, in, in the health arena, uh, chose a career that was particularly driven of being in service to a cause that he believed in, and to me that is often very inspiring, and I very often think about him as how would he tackle an issue or how would he work his way through a difficult moment. Final question here, real quickly. You have been so tremendously successful. You've risen really to become one of the true great thought leaders in sustainability. Tell us, everyone watching has one similar goal, one common goal, and that is how to do more good, how to have more impact in the world. Give us one tip we can take away from this uh, time together. I would say that in the end the hardest challenge is to let go of some of your ego and to focus on what really brings you happiness. Um, I was incredibly fortunate to, on my life path, um, find a partner, um, have four wonderful children, have some friends that always have been beacons of setting that direction. And I would say if there's one thing that I uh, wish others, it's the, the opportunity uh, to focus more on what uh, true happiness means for you uh, rather than what your ego seems to tell you on an occasion. Excellent. Jules, I, I know there will be people who are watching this that will want to tap into your expertise. Tell us how best to, to do that. Well, i um, delighted to engage with them. Uh, you can find us on the web at www.rmi.org or at www.carbonwarroom.org. 
Uh, my email is jules, J-U-L-E-S, at rmi.org. Look forward to engaging with you. Jules, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. We wish you every success in the great work you're doing. Great. Thank you very much, Devin. It was a pleasure to be here. All righty. Let's do some good.